I'm very glad to welcome you to Christchurch St Albans this morning. It's Sunday the 1st of November 2020 and this is indeed the fourth Sunday before Advent so we're beginning to uh, look towards Christmas and all the events surrounding that. Obviously we don't know what's going to happen this Christmas uh, with the pandemic but we'll keep you in touch with that but we will be doing something be that live, online or both. So we open our service today by singing uh, together. Before we sing our praises again to our, our Lord and our Saviour, we're firstly going to confess our sins. And we do so with great confidence because of these comfortable words that our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hear what St Paul says. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And hear what St John says. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. These are enormous truths that give us great reassurance not least that as we confess our sins, he is both faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we say together, Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. 
for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. The mighty God who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As his wonderfully forgiven people, let us worship, let us worship our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Let us turn to him fully without reservation.
Some of these songs that we sing together are just so beautiful, aren't they? They're so intimate uh, and they draw us near to Christ in, in a way that's uh, perhaps beyond words for us. But even as we uh, are together this morning, uh, allow, let's allow ourselves to have our hearts warmed, melted perhaps. A little bit stretched. Lord, turn our hearts uh, towards you that we may know you in our lives as a vivid and living presence. May your spirit not be far from us ever as we seek to serve you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hello. I'm John Truscott, a member of the congregation here at Christ Church, and we're looking today at uh, the beginning of a new sermon series on the book of 2 Timothy. And this is an introduction today, both to Timothy and the book, and we're going to be looking at uh, this now for the next three months or so in a series of sermons, which I'm really excited about because we're going to have a chance to get to grips with this wonderful book of the New Testament. If you're following me with it and have an NIV, it's probably on page 1195. It depends on the version that you've got. But there will be a set of notes on the website uh, in the media section for Christ Church, along with the audio recording. The first thing I want to do is to look at three R's. By the way, my spelling as your workout is atrocious. And my three R's are to look at the writer, to look at the recipient, and to look at us, the readers, the writer, the recipient, and the readers. Let's look at the writer, first of all. Most of Paul's letters are written to churches, so you get Romans, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, but there's a group of three known as the pastoral epistles, which cover 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, and there's also a letter to Philemon, and these are written to individuals, so they're more intimate. 2 Timothy was probably written by Paul. We're not 100% certain of that. Some people disagree with that, but I'm going to assume it was written by Paul. And he's writing this letter after the history period at the end of Acts. So we're now beyond Acts of the Apostles, and he's now a prisoner in Rome. Now, in the Acts, he's under house arrest in Rome, but then we think he travelled further, and then when older, was actually imprisoned in Rome. Now, I've uh, recently come back from a, a holiday in Harlech in West Wales before they closed the boundaries lines and didn't let us English people in. And uh, in Harlech, if you know it, there's one of the great Welsh castles. It stands out a mile. You see it from miles away. And it's a wonderful edifice. But castles like that had dungeons. And dungeons were cold. They were damp. They were rat infested. Uh, they were miserable, dark, miserable affairs. And that's what the sort of thing that Paul is in now. We need to remember that as we look at this letter, that he's writing from a dungeon which th where things are not comfortable. He's chained to a guard and it'll be a pretty miserable existence. It says in 2 Timothy um, chapter 2 that he's chained like a criminal. And the words of 2 Timothy are the last printed words that we have from St Paul before he was beheaded. Being a Roman citizen, he was, we believe, killed and probably therefore by beheading. So that's the writer, an old man now, in a terrible situation. But who's he writing to? Who's the recipient? Well, Timothy was Paul's assistant for about 15 years. He came from Lystra. Uh, from a Jewish believing mother and grandmother. We read about that in Acts chapter 16 and also about that in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And he leads the church at Ephesus. We're told that in 1 Timothy. Now Paul had led him to Christ because he describes him as my true son in the faith. And Timothy went then with him on two of Paul's long journeys, his, his uh, missionary journeys, and was with him when Paul was under house arrest in Rome. But, and this I find the most exciting and wonderful thing about Timothy and about the, this book we're going to be looking at. He was no alpha male. He was in fact a bit wet, if anything. We're told he was young, probably in his thirties. 
uh, in 1 Timothy, Paul says, don't let anybody um, look down on you because of your youth. We're told he was sickly in 1 Timothy chapter 5. He had frequent illnesses. And we're told that he was nervous because in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul has to tell him not to be timid. So here we have somebody who is, well, I think, just like most of us. He's young at the time of this letter. Uh, he's not terribly well health-wise, and he's pretty nervous. And I find that so encouraging because Paul has the highest regard for him. And he, he's a great worker in the, for, for the good news of Jesus Christ. And that shows that people like you and me can be like that too. And we'll pick that up in a few minutes. So that's introducing the writer, the recipient. What about the readers? Well, uh, the book for us is very practical in its instructions. That's, it's very intimate. There's quite a lot of emotion in it. And it's very relevant to us today because it's all about receiving the good news of Jesus Christ, of building up a church with that good news, and then of standing out to being different from the world. Now, before we go on, we're going to have three readings. One's going to tell us how Paul and Timothy first met. One's going to tell us from Philippians how Paul viewed Timothy and the high regard he had of him. And one will be the first five verses of 2 Timothy chapter 1, just to introduce this series uh, today. Then we'll come back and look more at Timothy after we've had these three readings. The first reading is from Acts 16 verses 1 to 5. He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for all they knew that his father was a Greek. As they travelled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. The second reading is from Philippians 2, verses 19 to 24. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to, to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son and with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. So Paul there saying, I have no one else like Timothy. And now I'm going to read from that uh, second letter to Timothy, the first, the first five verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. These are indeed the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there we had an introduction, how Paul and Timothy met, a description of what Timoth of Paul thought about Timothy, how highly he regarded him, and the first five verses of this letter, the second letter of Paul to Timothy, to set us on our way in the series that we'll be taking Sunday by Sunday for the next three months. Let's think a little bit more about Timothy himself now. I was amazed to discover that he's named 21 times in the Acts of the Apostles and in the Epistles, in addition to everything that comes up in these two letters to him from Paul. And there are six words I discovered that are used to describe him throughout all those references. Now, I don't know if Timothy was on Twitter or not, uh, but if you're on Twitter, you're asked to provide a short summary, bullet point summary of who you are, uh, and that goes, as it were, on your bio. 
Uh, a friend of mine has one that I love. He says, uh, I'm the father of, uh, I'm the husband of one, the father of three, and a servant of the three in one. I'm the husband of one, the father of three, and the servant of the three in one. Work it out. Now, if we're going to have to give Timothy a, fray, a few bullet points to introduce him on Twitter, then I think these six headings would fit very well. But before I come and run through the six, we're going to do them quite quickly, do notice that he is not described as a bishop or a leader, though he led a church. He's not described as a great preacher, though Paul had to teach him about preaching quite a bit. Nor is he described as an apostle, which he was not. But in much more lowly terms, as I said earlier on, he's a very ordinary person and we can identify with that. That's what makes these books so exciting. In fact, God can do extraordinary things through very ordinary people, as we shall see. So here come the six. First of all, disciple. In that passage we had read in Acts 16, it says Paul came to Derby and Lystra where a disciple named Timothy lived. Now, I love the word disciple. It's somebody under the discipline, that's where it comes from, of, of following, being a follower of Jesus Christ. And uh, I want to ask you and I want to ask myself, are we uh, uh, an attender at Christ Church? Are we a member, this is better, of Christ Church? Or much better still, are we a disciple of Jesus Christ? Do we belong to Christ Church or to Jesus Christ? If we put ourselves in the latter category, we are a disciple, somebody seeking to serve our master. So disciple. Secondly, helper. Uh, in Acts 19, uh, it says Paul sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia. Now, you can't get a much more lowly word than helper. Was he the leader? No. Was he the great grand duke, as it were? No. He was a helper. But helping is, is actually one of the gifts of the Spirit. It comes in 1 Corinthians 12. And the church needs people as helpers. There's lots to do in the church, the global church. And God needs helpers in his work of bringing in the harvest. It can be a real privilege to be a lowly helper because of the one we're helping. We're helping, as it were, surprisingly, God himself in his work. Are you a helper? Am I a helper? Or do we want to be the number one? So a disciple, secondly a helper. My third bullet point that he's described as, Timothy's described as, is a worker. Romans 16, I don't know if you noticed, um, he talks about Timothy, my co-worker. There's lots of references to that same word, co-worker or worker. As disciples, we're called to be workers, seeking to tell others, giving ourselves to the work of the good news of the kingdom of God. We're not there just to sit back in a chair and relax and gain from church life. We're there to work, all of us, all of us. You can't have a Christian who's not a worker. So disciple, helper, worker. Number four, being a servant. Philippians 1.1 1, 1 starts, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Paul loved to describe himself as a servant and often as a slave. But Timothy's described here as a servant too. And we're all called to be servants. Are we seeking to serve the Lord who died for us? Or do we want to be the number one ourselves? Is he our master, our Lord, to be obeyed? and to be honoured. The calling to be a Christian is a calling to servanthood, whatever role we play in the church. One, two, three, four. Number five, brother, more intimate now. Two Corinthians starts off, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. Christians are one big family. We have God as our father, therefore we're sisters and brothers of each other. If we're disciples, we, that, that's the family relationship we have. Perhaps we don't use that term in, in the Church of England quite enough, but we are brothers and sisters of each other if we are followers and disciples of our Lord. Now, I'm a, I'm a loyal Anglican myself. I love the Church of England, but I don't like its use of language for clergy. I hope Jeremy and Delhi will forgive me, 
uh, but they're described as reverent, as if the rest of us are irreverent. Some clergy are described <clears throat> as very reverent. Some clergy still are described as right reverent. And some are described as venerable, the venerable. But here, Paul would have none of that. He claims to be an apostle for himself very often to give the authority he needed to say what he wanted to say. But most for everybody, including himself, and especially for Timothy, we're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Keeps us in our place, but it gives us that wonderful family relationship. Disciple, helper, worker, servant, brother, and finally, in even more intimate terms, son. Or as Paul often says, my dear son. 2 Timothy 1, 2. Did you notice started off? The letter said to Timothy, my dear son. Now, it seems that Paul had brought Timothy to faith. And so Timothy was his son in the new birth in that way. And the good news for all of us is that even if for various reasons we cannot have children ourselves, we can have spiritual children. Those who we've brought to faith in Christ, those who we've taught, those who we've built up in the faith, those who we've helped to go on in discipleship. And that's so exciting. Uh, in the country at the moment, we're talking about an R factor. We want to keep it lower than one. But in the Christian life, we want an R factor that's greater than one, because then the church will grow. We want to infect people with the good news of Jesus Christ so that the R number is greater than one and the church grows. So there are six bullet points for a Twitter, as it were, uh, introduction to Timothy. A disciple, a helper, a worker, a servant, a brother and a son. I think they're great. Six words, lowly in many ways, but so true of us. Remember, God can do extraordinary things through very ordinary people. And if you want to remember those six, they're quite a difficult list. They don't alliterate or anything like that. Remember this sentence. Don't holiday in Watford, stay behind in St Albans. Don't holiday in Watford, stay behind in St Albans. Don't, disciple, D. Holiday, H, helper. In Watford, W, worker. Stay, S, servant. Behind, brother, in St Albans, son. So say to each other, in your family, in your friendship group or whatever, don't holiday in Watford, stay behind in St Albans and see if you can remember what those six letters refer to. But do pick up a copy or do download a copy of the notes which we're going on later on Sunday uh, on the website in the media section along with the audio recording of this talk. So there's Timothy, what a wonderful man. And we're going to be studying him now for the next few weeks. Week by week, we will look and see what Paul writes to him to help him to grow up as a Christian. I think that's going to be tremendous, and I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you are too. So John's given us a lot to think about as he's expounded the scriptures to us and introduced our discussion of the second epistle to Timothy. As a response to that, we're going to do two things now. Firstly, we're going to sing again. Uh, a breath of life comes sweeping through us and this is a call for the Holy Spirit to be active in renewing and reviving his church and that may well be a very personal prayer that we need to offer in response to this morning or it may be more general as we seek the renewal of the church in this land. And then we're going to head from that straight into our intercessions which are based around Psalm 34. So we're going to sing and then we're going to uh, pray together. <laughs> Till I'm 
going to say some prayers of intercession together uh, using some words from Psalm 34. I'm hoping that there will be enough space for you to offer your own prayers as well as be guided uh, as well by me. And we say together, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Lord Jesus, may our praises be ever close to our lips. May we not be far away from thank yous. May we see your glory. May we worship you together, be strengthened and encouraged by each other. And we pray for those today who will be alone in their faith for those who are being persecuted who are lost and bereaved who through force of circumstance cannot meet with your people we pray that you would strengthen them to praise your name and to see your glory and now for a few moments offer up your own prayers of praise and thanksgiving I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Lord, we thank you for answered prayer. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for when we've been aware of it. We thank you for when you've saved us from ourselves without us knowing it. We pray for deliverance, even in these days, from the things that haunt us, from the enemies that encamp around us, from fear itself. Help us to look to you that our faces and our hearts may shine with radiance because of you and never be ashamed. We call out to you, Lord, and we know that you hear us. 
and we thank you for the angel of the Lord encamped around about. So let us pray for those who perhaps are afraid or have many troubles. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And Lord, we ask for ourselves and for others that you would provide our daily bread. Give us what we need. Let us be content with what you give. Help us to crucify the flesh as necessary, but help us trust in you. May we not have any fear other than in you himself, because we will lack nothing. And we pray for those who we know struggle through illness or disability, through loneliness and grief, through circumstances through lack of forgiveness, through hopelessness and despair. We pray for all these, that they may turn to you and that you would provide for their daily bread. And now an opportunity just to offer any prayers that you have uh, to the Lord himself. And then we'll say together the Lord's Prayer. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So today we've sung his praises, we've prayed to him, we've used psalms, readings, we've heard from his word, we've thought a little bit about what it might mean to be Christian disciples in this day and age. We've offered up prayers for those that we know and love, and we've thought about our own behaviour, and we've received forgiveness and assurance of forgiveness from Christ himself. With all these things in mind, as very, very grateful people, let's sing our final song, uh, our final moment to worship together, and then I'll say a blessing as we leave uh, whatever we're doing and uh, go off into the rest of our lives today. Through the darkness, your loving kindness. 
And so, may Christ our King make you faithful and strong to do his will, that you may reign with him in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you and all those for whom you pray, now and forever. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>